Welcome back. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Last week, we jumped into a spirited debate on race, cultural pathology, and the Obama presidency that was volleying between the Atlantic's Tana Hesse Coates and New York Magazine's Jonathan Chait. This week, the debate continued on a new track with the publication of Chait's New York cover story on how, quote, race has been the real story of the Obama presidency all along. In the piece, Chait argues race, always the deepest and most volatile fault line in American history, has now become the primal grievance in our politics, the source of a narrative of persecution each side uses to make sense of the world. Liberals dwell in a world of paranoia, of a white racism that has seeped out of American history in the Obama years and lurks everywhere, mostly undetectable. Conservatives dwell in a paranoia of their own, in which racism is used as a cudgel to delegitimize delegitimize their core beliefs. And the horrible thing is that both of these forms of paranoia are right. Okay, indulge me for just a moment as I share a story. In the months immediately following President Obama's 2009 inauguration, I addressed a group of white Southerners who had supported Obama's 2008 candidacy. One man raised his hand and shared with me this insight. He said, ma'am, I've seen the change. I've lived in South Carolina my whole life, and I've always seen black men walking with their heads down. But since Obama became president, I've noticed they're walking straighter. They're looking me in my eye and smiling. Obama made black people proud. Now they know they can do anything. To which I responded, sir, I think it's not that the president made black people feel better about ourselves. I think that you guys helping us elect him made us feel better about y'all. Now, this man was no racist. He was part of a multiracial coalition that just elected the first black president. He was an optimist for his nation, and he was attempting a sincere observation of black life from his vantage point. But the problem was that his view was obscured. Now, let me get a little professorial here. W.B. Du Bois described in The Soul of Black Folks the veil behind which black life takes place. It's a description both of the physical barriers imposed by segregation, which make it difficult for black people to be seen, and a nation that sees whiteness as the norm and black life as the aberration. The man from South Carolina could not see past the veil, could not see outside of his own interpretation of what was happening to African Americans in the South. What he saw as evidence that black people had recently become proud of blackness, I saw as an indication that black people had become somewhat more optimistic about white America. For me, reading Jonathan Chait's New York cover story it reminded me of that moment. Because Chait intends an earnest assessment of contemporary racial politics. Mr. Chait is, as I said last week, a smart writer. But the piece suffers, I think, from the same narrow vantage point as that well-meaning man from South Carolina. Chait describes what he believes is the real story of the Obama presidency. Quote, even when the red and blue tribes are not waging their endless war of mutual victimization, the subject of race courses through everything else. Debt, health care, unemployment. Whereas the great themes of the Bush years revolved around foreign policy and a cultural divide over what or who constituted real America, the Obama years have been defined by a bitter disagreement over the size of government, which quickly reduces to an argument over whether the recipients of big government largesse deserve it. There is no separating this discussion from one's sympathies or prejudices toward an identification with black America. But to suggest that the Bush years were largely free of racial discourse is to ignore that communities of color experienced foreign policy as race talk, interpreted the cultural divide over the real America as race talk, and ultimately understood the demise of Bush's influence in the wake of the Katrina disaster as race talk. To describe American racial politics as an endless war of mutual victimization suggests that there are no actual victims of a continuing racial policies, only that there are discursive points to be scored by equally matched sides. This is best described by Jamel Bowie, who wrote in a piece for Slate that Chait's argument is, quote, a story of mutual grievance between Americans on the left and the right with little interest in the lived experience of racism from black Americans and other people of color. It's a story, in other words, that treats race as an intellectual exercise, a low-stakes cocktail party argument between white liberals and white conservatives over their respective racial innocence. Now, Chait may have been lured into this trap because he studiously cites the research findings of several well-regarded social scientists who have for decades believed that questions of race only matter to the political conversation to the extent that white people disagree among themselves about how to treat racial minorities. Chait cites findings from their research as though it is settled truth, seemingly unaware of a raging debate of criticism of the kind of whites-only approach to the study of race. 
trying to understand American racial politics while failing to account in a very serious way for African-American perspectives and history causes smart people to ask the wrong questions, to fail to interrogate their own assumptions, and often to come to the wrong conclusions. Conclusions, I think, like this. If you set out to write a social history of the Obama years, one that captured the day-to-day -day experiences of political life, you would find that race has saturated everything as perhaps never before. That never before could only be true if you don't account for black folks' story as part of the story about race. And I think that makes your story wrong. But as I was reminded by Ta-Nehisi Coates' recent offering, the point of public debate is not to declare victory. But instead, it is always to expand one's limited understanding of our complicated world. And it is in that spirit that I welcome now from Washington, D.C., the author of the New York Magazine cover article, Jonathan Chait. Jonathan, thank you for being here this morning. Thanks, and thanks for introducing your audience with such an open mind. I've really never seen a television show where the host berates and rebuts the person they're having on the show for several minutes before they're invited on. So uh, that's interesting, Jonathan, because I, I, I did not mean it as, in any way as a personal berating. Um, yeah. I undoubtedly was attempting to address what I see as your ideas. And uh, as you know, because we invited you on last week, you know, this is part of an ongoing conversation that we, right. you know, jumped into. So I don't mean it to berate you personally. I do think that your article fails in this really critical way. And it is, uh -huh. um, it, it is for me, the, the thing that I want to talk to you about. You, you said that you set out to, to write a social history of the Obama years. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if, in fact, you feel that, that you have succeeded in that. I'm not writing a social history of the Obama years. I'm writing about how politics has changed in the Obama years. And what I'm writing about and what these social scientists have described is that race has become more salient. I do not say anywhere in this article that race did not matter prior to the Obama years, because I don't believe that and I didn't argue that. What these findings have showed is that race has become more important to how everyone thinks about American politics during the Obama years for the obvious reason that now we have a black president. So, so obviously, race has probably become a more salient thing to black Americans all along. But it's become, but it's become more important. It's, it's become more forefront in the consciousness of, consciousness of white Americans during the Obama years. And this is an important change that I'm trying to describe. John, I think, I think that's interesting. Um, the, the, um, the modifier that you just used um, isn't used very much in the article itself. And I wonder if that's just in part then the challenge that I had with it. Because the article purports to talk about race becoming more important and more salient to Americans overall or to the American political discourse. Right. But just now as you were talking, you modified that by saying it became important to white Americans in a new way. And that seems to me to be a very different claim because then you are, you're acknowledging that this is really a piece primarily about white racial attitudes, which I think is a reasonable thing to, to write an article about. But if you're writing an article about America and then sort of ignoring the ways in which there is a clear countervailing right. argument around racialized communities, then it does seem to me an inaccurate statement. Well, look, I'm not writing a piece about the state of racism in America, which is a right. fantastic topic. It's just not the subject of this piece. I'm writing about American politics. And what I write is that the important divide on this question is actually not between black and white, as a lot of people feared it would be. It's between left and right or Democrat and Republican. So these two sides, the liberal side is a multiracial coalition. So it includes black Americans and white Americans. But what's interesting about the way this divide affects them is it affects them as ideal logs, not as people by race per se. So that's the focus. I'm focusing. Uh, there are plenty of perspectives of black and white people alike in this piece. But the way I'm examining them is how they has how they vote and how they think as Democrats or Republicans versus how they think as white and black people. So let's dig into that claim a little bit, because, because I think okay. that for, for me, as I'm as I'm reading it and particularly the, the social scientists that you cite. So part of yeah. I think what happens for me is that as a political scientist, right, I get a, I have a lot at stake in the academic part of it. and I'm trying to avoid doing mm -hmm. too much of that on TV, because I can imagine that's got to be boring. But but part of it is that the, the researchers that you cite yeah. have also been critiqued often for exactly the focus that you talked about, which is to say that the primary concern of the politics of race uh, is really just the politics around sort of how whites disagree about race and for not accounting for the ways that African-Americans are not just part of the blue tribe, but then in fact within, for example, that Democratic coalition are still consistently um, arguing with and having big uh, perceptual divides between black and white Democrats, for example. Right. Well, that's an important question. It's just not the subject of this story. So I just don't understand saying, 
I wish you had written a story about a different subject as Jamal Bowie does. It's just, that's fine. Go write that story. That's a great subject. It's just not what I'm writing about. So I think, I guess, I, I think that's where we disagree is that for yeah. me, if you are, um, that the model, that the model is misspecified, that there are hypotheses that don't get sort of laid out if, in fact, you don't think about that aspect of the story kind of while you're telling the big one. L let me ask you, because I, I, I do feel, um, I do try not to be unfair in the way that that your initial statement suggested. So let, let me just ask you this. I, I always feel like my, um, some of the greatest lessons I have learned have been from those who have been most critical of me. And um, I'm wondering, in the context of the debate that's now been going on for quite some time, I mean, your yeah. offering most recently has kind of shifted it, but there was the black pathology debate two weeks ago and then this. What, what has shifted for you at all? Has there been any moment where you're like, okay, on this thing, um, I think there's, you know, there's a point that, that I might have shifted or, or done this differently? Well, I think what's what really unfortunate is the timing of those two things. This story has been conceived for months, and I've been working on it for weeks, and it was written before I, ha I started this debate with Coates. But I think, unfortunately, that debate came out online first, and it mm -hmm. primed the way a lot of people, including you, came to think of my piece and came to think of me as, here's Chait, the conservative enemy of us, and let's, let's tear his piece apart. And I think if that debate had never come out, people would be reading this piece in a completely different way than how they are. So oh. that was really a big mistake. Well, I, I, I will just say this one thing, Jonathan, I, I don't at all think of you as a conservative enemy. One, I don't think of conservatives as enemies. But also, this, this debate is actually mostly interesting to me because I think of us as very similarly positioned in the coalition. I'm always actually more interested in sort of those who are on the same side and the kind of, con and, and not that there's just one or two sides, but like right. who have some similar um, sort of end goals, but then have these deeply different divides. Those are actually the ones that I find most right. interesting rather than like, oh, this right. person is just always against me. Well, that, so again, I think that's that's the really unfortunate thing that I regret. Regret I got into a, what I thought was a pretty interesting debate about race and race in America with Coates, and then people read this piece and thought, well, this is about race and race in America, and it's just not. And I think that really contributed to a pretty widespread misreading of the article, which sure. I hope people would read in, in a more open frame of mind. All right. Jonathan Jay, thank you for joining us from Washington, D.C. Okay. Stay right there, everyone. When we come back, I'm going to bring my panel in and take a closer look at how the president talks about race.